There has been much attention given to the reopening of churches over the past three or four weeks. Beside the obvious safety issues, church leaders are taking into consideration the fact that things have changed since the pandemic began. How we conduct ministry has changed. How we gather has changed. How we staff has changed and so on. The question many ask is whether or not we'll be able to return to normal and carry out ministry like we did at the beginning of the year. And the answer is no. That kind of normal is past. There's a new normal. And the new incorporates elements of the old. However, because the pandemic thrust us into making changes, we will not be able to return to the old ways completely. And these changes that constitute the new normal have to do with ministry methodology, the ways in which we carry out ministry. Some have to do with administration, some have to do with location, they have to do with people interaction and connection. And I don't necessarily want to address methodology or administration or location today. I want to talk about something that's more timeless. I want to touch on aspects of living out our faith together, or more specifically, I want to address the motives behind the idea of living out our faith together, because pandemic or no pandemic, these motives must characterize all that we do as a local body of believers. The scripture for today's message comes from Paul's first letter to Timothy. And in chapter 1, verse 5, we read, The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Allow me to take this passage and place it within its context. The book of Acts closes with Paul in prison in a hired house in Rome where he stays for at least two years. And Luke seems to suggest that Paul was released from there and he travels with Timothy and Titus around the Roman Empire before heading back east again. And he left Timothy on the island of Crete to guide the emerging church that was meeting there. And he takes Timothy with him to Ephesus where there was already an established church. And the apostle leaves Timothy in Ephesus while he himself travels up to Macedonia. It appears to me that Timothy had a twofold mission while he was there in Ephesus. He was to emphasize true teaching while at the same time correcting erroneous teaching. And secondly, he was to work out uh, a place of health, restore the health of the church through truth. In this letter, Paul urges Timothy to continue with his work at Ephesus because there was erroneous teaching going on that needed not only to be stopped but corrected. In addition, Paul urges Timothy to get those men to quit focusing on myths and genealogies rather than truth. After all, those fruitless teachings and discussions hinder rather than build up the kingdom. What a position for Timothy to be in. After all, Tim was an outsider, appointed by Paul. He wasn't a local boy. He was left behind in Ephesus to oversee the ministry. Would the elders there accept his teaching? Would he have any success with those who were teaching falsehood? Would he be viewed with contempt as a Mr. Know-it-all coming in, trying to take control of the church? After all, who was he to be pointing out their errors? So Timothy did seem to be in a predicament. But his mentor knew fully well the challenges that he would face, and he knew Timothy's temperament. And therefore, he reminds his son in the faith to stay focused. Circumstances will always change. However, focus must remain consistent. I've shared in the past, I'm not a big fan of speaking to a video camera. In nearly 30 years of pastoral ministry, I've not had to do this until circumstances changed, until the pandemic forced us into seeking alternative ways of communicating the gospel to one another under a stay-at-home executive order issued from our governor. Circumstances change. The focus or the goal behind the message must remain. In our scripture, Notice how Paul informs Timothy of what the goal of his instruction is to be. 
He says the goal of this command is love. In other words, the goal is to focus or to foster on love. And I know this seems a bit generic, but when you stop and think about it, love is the motivator of life. God created all that is to share his love with his creation. Love carried Jesus to the cross. Love must be behind why we share the gospel with others, why we instruct one another. And as such, love must be the driving force behind living out our faith together. Love for God, love for one another. Any other reason is simply not acceptable. When you stop and think about it, love can be a bit confusing. For some, it's something that's subjective or relative. In other words, we tend to make it out to be something that we think it should be or something we want it to be individually. For some, it's a feeling or an emotion that's tossed about by every wind of circumstance. For some, it's a list of actions that we perform or that someone performs for us. No actions, no love. I'm not totally convinced that love can be defined in a sentence or two. It seems the best that we can do is describe its characteristics. I mean, that's what Paul did in his letter to the church of Corinth. Following his in-depth discussion on spiritual gifts and how they should function within the body of Christ, he tells the church that as important and as essential as spiritual gifts are, there's something that's even more important and more essential. He tells them it is the most excellent of ways to interact with one another. And as you begin reading chapter 13, you see he's referring to love. Beginning in verse 4, he lists various characteristics that are bound in love. He doesn't go into great detail in explaining what these characteristics are, but his readers would have known what he was talking about, and so he just lays them out before them. He says love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hope, always perseveres. Love never fails. Whether we return to physically gathering together in a week or a month or even a year, our focus must not be on the physical gathering as the ultimate objective. The focus must be on love. Living out our faith together includes loving God and loving others. If you notice in 1 Timothy 1.5, the love Timothy is to exhibit comes in a threefold package or presentation. And why does Paul include these? Well, I think he includes them because presentation is important. When I worked in a restaurant, I came to the conclusion that presentation is important. A restaurant's food could be fantastic, but if the building is filthy, it will not matter to the customer how fantastic the food is. They won't come in and eat. When the food is placed on a plate, presentation is important. You can't slop it on a plate as if you're giving it to someone in a military chow line. The food may taste great, but it has to pass the inspection of the eye. And if the presentation is not acceptable, Seldom will the food go into the mouth. Let me ask you, why do we wrap gifts and presents? I mean, after all, we're just going to tear the paper into shreds and throw away the ribbons and throw away the bows, so why wrap a gift? Well, we wrap them because presentation is important. Now, I don't want to take this illustration too far when I'm talking about packaging love, but I think you get the idea of what I'm talking about. Love is perhaps the most awesome gift that we can receive. But we can package it in such a way that it seems detestable rather than something to be desired or appreciated. And I believe Paul understood this to be true. For he tells Timothy that there are three ways in which love must be packaged. First of all, Timothy is told that love must emanate from a pure heart. What's a pure heart? Well, basically, it's a heart that is pure. 
In the vast majority of cases, when Scripture speaks about the heart, it's in reference to the very center of man's being. It includes the mind or the thought process. Almost all our conscious actions begin in the mind. Information is processed in the mind. Communication is formulated in the mind. In addition to the mind, the heart includes the will or that part of man that makes choices. Granted, this works in conjunction with the mind. These various aspects don't stand independent of one another. They're systemic. The heart is also the seat of feelings or emotions. I mean, this concept is reflected in statements such as, I love you with all my heart. When someone does something that causes you to feel pain or grief, you may say that they've caused you heartache. It includes our conscience. It controls our affections. It's been said that the heart is the spiritual nucleus in a person about which life orbits. Timothy's in Ephesus, and the goal of his ministry must be fueled by a pure heart. Now, the adjective pure doesn't mean perfection or without flaw, because no one can possibly live that kind of life. Only Jesus lived the sinless life. The pure, as the word is also translated sincere, means we do not try to appear to be something that we're not because such a life is characterized by hypocrisy. And Timothy must be genuine. Pure also has to do with the idea of being without mixture or being unmixed. It was used in the Greek language to refer to pure wine, wine that didn't have any water mixed with it. Timothy's motives for ministry must remain unmixed. His ministry is to be fueled by love for those he is serving and by love for the one whom he is serving, Christ. Finally, pure has to do with keeping oneself free from sin. Following his sin with Bathsheba, David asks God to create a pure heart in him. Why? He knows that he can't do it. Only God can do it. And just as David could not, so we on our own, in our own strength and in our own ability, cannot develop a pure heart. Only the Holy Spirit can do this. Oh, we have a responsibility. Our responsibility in creating a pure heart is to submit and cooperate with God's divine work. The second part of this packaging is that love must come from a good conscience. I mentioned a moment ago that the conscience is a part of man's very being. It's that capacity in man that works in conjunction with the mind and the heart. Our conscience can act as a kind of spiritual radar. Many people feel that the conscience is given to us to teach us the difference between right and wrong. The problem with this assumption is the conscience is not our teacher. Rather, God places the conscience in us to send off warning signals when we deviate from the truth. You see, if we operate under the assumption that it's given to us to indicate what is right or what is wrong, rather than to warn us when we stray from the correct path, we begin to rely on our feelings to determine what is sin and what is not sin. In other words, sin then becomes a subjective thing. If we don't feel something is wrong, then it's not wrong. Feelings, however powerful they may be, are not accurate indicators of truth. It's the Holy Spirit who teaches us what is right and what is wrong based on the Word of God. And when we cross from right to wrong, our spiritual radar, our conscience, should go off signaling that trouble is invading. This is how a good, as opposed to a bad, conscience works. How do you keep a good conscience? Well, quite simply, obey. Obey God. Do what God says. Don't reject truth. Rather, live in light of it. The more we obey God, the easier it is to obey. 
The more we know the truth, the more sensitive our consciences will be. If we walk by the Spirit, we will not make provision for the flesh. We will want to obey God and obey His Word. Timothy must make sure that when he instructs others, his own conscience must be pure from sin and selfish motives. There can be no hypocrisy present. What he instructs, he must personally live up to the truths that he's teaching others. And he has to apply them to his own life as well. A good conscience leads its owner to obey the word of God. Not only must love be packaged in a pure heart and a good conscience, it must also be bound in a sincere faith. The world has many faiths today, doesn't it? However, not all faiths are true. And the world will try and get us to believe that there are many paths to heaven. If they even acknowledge that there is heaven, or there is a God in the first place. As I mentioned three weeks ago, faith is an interesting concept. For Christians, faith includes a set of beliefs and doctrines. There's a certain amount of intellectual knowledge that's included in our faith. However, faith is more than the accumulation of spiritual data. In addition, faith is not some blind leap into the unknown. Whenever I hear something like that, I, I can't help but think about the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade and how in order to save his father who had been shot, uh, Jones stands at the edge of a large void that plunges up hundreds of feet into darkness. And he has to cross this gorge, but there's no way to do so. And then he remembers that he read something from his father's journal only in the leap from the lion's head will he prove his worth. And he remembers his father's words, you must believe, boy, you must believe. Scared but determined, he takes a step into nothingness, only to have his foot rest on a bridge that had materialized after he took that leap of faith. Listen, such a concept of faith has to remain in Hollywood. For those in Christ, faith always has an object. And the object of our faith is Jesus Christ. And this faith is grounded in who Jesus is and what he has done, what he is doing, what he will do, and what he has said. Faith has content. It has an object. Faith must result in some kind of action. You see, faith has to do not only with what one believes, it also has to do with how this belief is lived out day by day. So that moves from the head and the heart where truth is received and recognized, and then it is expressed in daily life and how one lives. The word sincere is important. Basically, the word was used in ancient Greece of an actor who was on stage, one who assumes to be what he really is not. It's the same word from which we get our English word, hypocrite. However, there's a prefix on this word in Greek that makes the noun refer to one who is not hypocritical. It refers rather to one who is not in disguise, but is genuine and real. And therefore, the faith that is referred to by Paul is a true faith, a real faith, not an imitation. Not every faith will lead one to a saving relationship with God. There's only one faith that accomplishes that. And it's anchored in the truth of the Bible and is revealed in God the Son, Jesus Christ. As I mentioned at the beginning of this message, there is and will be a new normal once restrictions are relaxed. And the new normal will affect ministry methodology, the ways in which we carry out ministry. It will affect administration and location. It will affect people, interaction, and connections. In other words, it will affect how we live out our faith together. Yet pandemic or no pandemic, love must characterize and drive all that we do as a local body of believers, individually and as a corporate body. 
It must be the reason behind what we do. It must be the goal of our ministry to one another and to others. As individuals, we know where to love God with our entire being. And we know where to love others as Jesus loves us. Now these are not just some lofty ideals. They're what God requires of us. And because they're so important, because they're so essential, He's provided a way for us to love in this fashion. We are able to love God and love one another because, as Romans 5, 5 points out, God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. If such a love is not present and active in our lives, we must seriously question what kind of relationship we have with God. God does not pour his love into our hearts only to have it be inactive or stagnant or dormant. And that's why the love Paul talks about is the goal of his ministry, which needs to be the goal of Timothy's ministry, must come from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. As we continue in this pandemic era, this is and will continue to be the goal and the motivating force behind what we do here as a local church. Our methodologies may change. In many cases, they've already changed and will continue to change, but our objectives will never change. All that we do, all that we teach, must aid us in drawing deeper in love with God. And as our love for God deepens, we will be able to love our, love our neighbors the way God intends for us to love him. And if what we do here in this local church doesn't help you develop a deeper love for God, then we've missed the mark. Just as the love we have for God and for one another must come from a pure heart, so we need to help one another develop a love that comes from a pure heart. As such, we must encourage confession of sin. We must promote repentance. We must never condone or justify sin under any circumstances. Sin must never become subjective. Rather, we must encourage one another to avoid it. And that's why we need to encourage surrender to the Holy Spirit so that we may walk in the Spirit rather than in the flesh. Out of love, we must encourage one another to be holy as God is holy. And we must emphasize loyalty and obedience to Him. Just as we must help one another develop a love that comes from a pure heart, so must we help one another develop a good conscience. We must continue to stress the importance of having a sensitive cons conscience so that when we fall into sin, the Holy Spirit may convict us and, and move us to a place of confession and repentance so that we can maintain a pure heart before God and man. And God forbid that we should grieve or quench the Spirit's moving in our lives. An essential way to develop a good conscience is through instruction. We must instruct one another in God's ways. I mean, after all, that's what discipleship is all about, isn't it? I mean, we can instruct in a formal setting, such as a classroom or a group study, and we can instruct in a practical, hands-on manner, such as mentoring, where we pattern what it is like to follow Christ. And finally, just as we must help one another develop a love that comes from a pure heart and a good conscience, we must help one another cultivate a sincere faith. I'm not referring to the trait or quality of being sincere, because there are many people who do things with great sincerity, even though what they're doing is wrong. 
Likewise, there's many people who believe things with great sincerity, even though what they believe is sincerely wrong. Remember I mentioned sincerity has to do with being real or genuine. It doesn't just look real. It is real. It is grounded in Jesus Christ. It is disclosed in Scripture. And it is lived through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You see, for there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called. One hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. Ministry methods may change in this pandemic environment. They will certainly change in a post-pandemic environment. But as far as our local body of believers is concerned, our goal will remain the same. Love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Will you join us in this effort? Let's live out our faith together for the glory of God.